1984, Columbia Pictures released what they hoped to be a solid base hit of a sci-fi comedy. Little did they know, they had created an instant classic and sparked a revolutionary fandom in the process. Sequels, cartoons, comic books, video games, conventions, remakes. But today we focus on an immersive medium beyond the screen that not many films have the opportunity to explore. Time to suit up and grab your proton packs. This is The History of the Ghostbusters at Universal Theme Parks. Contrary to popular belief, the Ghostbusters were never meant to be the tan-suited extermination men and women we all know and love today. The Ghostbusters first started off as a project between Dan Aykroyd and longtime on and off screen best friend John Belushi. The original concept and script saw the two former Blues Brothers travel through time and space to fend off supernatural threats. In March of 1982, the untimely death of John Belushi not only shook the comedy film industry, but forced a course redirect for the proposed Ghostbusters film. With the aid of newly appointed writer and co-star Harold Ramis, as well as director Ivan Reitman, the story was shifted from a space tale to a more realistic New York City-based science fiction comedy. The film would be picked up by Columbia Pictures and given a budget of $25 million, which would eventually end up somewhere closer to 30 million. Inherently, CGI ghosts and lasers cost a lot of money back in the early 80s. 40 years later, I could do them on my computer with nothing but a subscription to a video graphic site and a film degree from YouTube University. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the film also had some pretty stellar set design, costume design, and legendary acting performances, all of which led it to become the second most profitable film of 1984 with an in-year profit of $229 million, falling just short to Beverly Hills Cop. As Universal was planning for their first park in Orlando, Florida, there were some pretty obvious choices when it came to which Universal movies should be featured on attractions at the park, with some really solid rides like Jaws, Back to the Future, and E.T., but relying on Universal Pictures alone might not be the best idea. After all, not every live-action Universal movie was a hit at the time, and I'm pretty sure no one was wanting to see a ride based off of Roddy Piper's debut leading role in They Live. While today you could find countless licensed out intellectual properties across all Universal Parks, Ghostbusters, along with Beetlejuice, were among the first to be featured at Universal Studios Florida, both of which actually played a major part in the park's main advertising campaign when the park opened in 1990. Ghostbusters Spooktacular was a stage show that debuted along with the park and was located in the New York area. Behind me sits the former location of Ghostbusters Spooktacular, where the modern day Jimmy Fallon ride is today. The entrance used to be on the far side of the building where today you could find the facade of the Hook and Ladder Company 8, the home base of the Ghostbusters in the film franchise. There were actually two different versions of Ghostbusters Spooktacular, the only major difference being one had a pre-show and one did not. For that very reason, we will mainly be talking about the second version of the show to avoid repeating myself over and over again. <laughs> Entering through the firehouse doors, guests would find themselves inside of Soundstage 50, where a seminar held by Lewis Tully was being held. Of course, Lewis Tully being the junior assistant vice president of finance for the Ghostbusters, portrayed by Rick Moranis in the film. As any standard theme park pre-show goes, there was plenty of crowd work and involved select volunteers, some gooey substance, and a mind-reading device. You know, all these standard stuff. Once guests moved into the second room, the main theater, which is where you'll be able to find the recreation of the Temple of Gozer as seen in the first movie, but that wouldn't be revealed until later. First would be the sales pitch. I mean, sorry, the presentation. Lewis would begin to showcase the new Ghostbusters products in a late night infomercial manner, highlighting starter kits for at home use of varying experience levels before being interrupted by Walter Peck, a government agent and the secondary antagonist from the first film, who was also the eventual mayor of New York City in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. But it is here in Orlando, Florida in the early 90s where he would drop by for daily 
weekly checkups on the Ghostbusters in an attempt to shut them down after multiple violations from the Environmental Protection Agency. Did I stutter? Oh, no, you just spit, though. <laughs> Fed up with Lewis's antics, Peck begins to shut off the comically large breakers that power each section of Ghostbusters HQ, leading up to the big red one that just so happens to be the power to the containment unit holding the ghosts who would appear above the stage behind glass panels. This visual was achieved by using a Pepper's Ghost effect, an illusion commonly used in theme parks where an image is reflected onto a transparent screen at a 45 degree angle, where audience members could see a reflected virtual image that seems to have a depth and appear out of nowhere. If you can't tell by the pillars in front of the stage, creating a slightly restricted view for everyone in the theater, these are what is separating the giant panes of slightly angled glass from one another, illuminating many ghosts that Lewis had just released, including Slimer and some other ghosts that might look familiar if you happen to be a fan of the horror genre. See, for the production of Ghostbusters Spooktacular, Universal would seek the aid of Charles Chiodo, a legendary production designer and creature fabricator. And it just so happens that around the same time of the production of Spooktacular, he was also working on a little project called Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Space. See the resemblance? While these creatures began appearing and disappearing in ghost form, the big bad villain Gozer showed up front and center. A battle ensues as the Ghostbusters fight off Gozer and in the big finale, a returning Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man from the film. Basically recreating the events from the film while telling a semi new or unique story in the process. This Marshmallow Man at the time was one of, if not the world's largest indoor animatronic. As you would assume, it was in fact only a hollow head, but still would take a lot of tech to operate. The Ghostbusters defeat the monster and it disappears in a cloud of smoke as the heroes celebrate their victory. After the show, you'd exit through the gift shop titled Paranormal Store, which sold various Ghostbusters merchandise and had some pretty cool set pieces, very reminiscent of the types of immersive retail spots Universal builds today in their tribute stores. More on that later. Ghostbusters Spooktacular ran from June 7th of 1990 until November 8th of 1996 and closed to make way for Twister Ride It Out, a special effects stage show themed after the blockbuster Universal and Amblin Entertainment film that released earlier that year. After the Ghostbusters were evicted from Soundstage 50, they didn't have to move very far at all. In fact, they were already right here where you could find them in any of their three different street shows featuring Beetlejuice. Street Busters was a street show that Universal began running in early 1991 and ran seasonally until 1993. During its run, the Ghostbusters would enter the park through the Pantages Theater, which is now home to Universal's horror makeup show. They would begin here and take the iconic Ecto-1 all the way over here, where they had a run-in with the ghost with the most as he cast a spell on the Ghostbusters, forcing them to dance to popular songs of the time as they try to resist his mind games. There was also a version of this that ran in and around the first year of Halloween Horror Nights. This was called Beetlejuice Dead in Concert. It was basically the same show, but with a different name and operating hours. Fun fact, these first two runs of the show were actually one of the first gigs at the start of the acting career of a young Wayne Brady. As the regular on Whose Line Is It Anyway and host of Let's Make a Deal would be part of the Street Busters show and meet and greet guests around the New York area of the park. Closing in 1993, most likely due to budget cuts, Street Busters would return under a different name nine years later in October of 2002. Now named Extreme Ghostbusters The Great Frightway, likely as a cross promotion with the animated series titled Extreme Ghostbusters that originally aired in 1997. The only major difference in the show this time around was the soundtrack. <laughs> It's at this time that they also introduced a holiday version of the show that they would run in November and December. <laughs> and 
and some costume color variants to reflect the outfits from the cartoon. Still nowhere near comfortable for anyone to be wearing around a theme park, but hey, you know what is? Roosevelt's. I'll say it time and time again, these Roosevelt shirts are the absolute best when it comes to looking and feeling cool around the parks. You've seen me rocking them in literally every video I've put out since the beginning of this channel, and it's for good reason. With officially licensed collections from some of your favorite franchises like Universal Monsters, Five Nights at Freddy's, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and so much more. Roosevelt's are breathable, comfortable, flexible, and right now, 15% off for all first orders through the link in the description of this video. Definitely head over to their site and check out the hundreds of designs they have from some of your favorite franchises. And don't worry about it, you can thank me later. When the Great Frightway show closed in 2005, the Ghostbusters sort of disappeared from Universal Parks. This was likely due to the fact that the Ghostbusters, an intellectual property owned and distributed by Sony Pictures, was being licensed out to Universal. Doing the math from park opening in 1990 all the way to when the final street performances happened in 2005, it seems like it was probably a 15-year contract between Sony and Universal Parks. It would be over 14 years until we would see the Ghostbusters here at Universal Florida again, and this time, it would come to us in the form of a haunted house. <laughs> In 2019, at both Halloween Horror Nights Orlando and Halloween Horror Nights Hollywood, the Ghostbusters made a big return to the parks with a house celebrating the 35th anniversary of the first movie's release. In Orlando, the haunted house was located in Soundstage 22 and was solely based off of the 1984 film. It included some fantastic set pieces, lighting effects, and obviously all of your favorite characters. Entering through the New York Public Library, where you'd be able to find a Pepper's Ghost Effect hologram of the library ghost, into the firehouse lined with proton packs on the walls, and Janine Melnitz answering the Ghostbusters hotline, the introduction of Slimer in the hotel scene, and a few nondescript ghosts leading up to the Temple of Gozer in the final scene from the film followed by a setup of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, very similar to the one in the stage show, which bear in mind was not exactly how it went down in the movie. Nonetheless, this was a very solid haunted house, and for obvious reasons, was one of the most popular haunted houses in Orlando and Hollywood that year. As part of the promotional efforts for the West Coast version of the event, Universal Hollywood invited star Dan Aykroyd and director Ivan Reitman to tour their version of the haunted house. The way they've deployed the, the, the funny ghosts in the movie and the ones that are more comical, they're pretty sudden, pretty exciting the way they reveal them. So we'll get that good mix of comedy and, and horror. Good screams and laughs at the same time. After the fall season of 2019 passed, Ecto-1 drove off into the sunset. Maybe 2019 was part of a greater plan, a litmus test to prove the popularity of the Ghostbusters decades after its initial release. With the release of a Ghostbusters spinoff, Answer the Call, in 2016 and its overwhelmingly mild reception, I'm sure many fans worried that if the Ghostbusters were to return to the parks, it would be in the form of this new cast. But in 2021, a direct sequel to the first two movies, Ghostbusters Ghostbusters Afterlife was released. Directed by Jason Reitman, the son of the original director Ivan Reitman, Afterlife was an addition to the Ghostbusters story that the property desperately needed. 
In the following years, theme park news publications everywhere had been hearing rumblings of a possible full-blown return for the Ghostbusters to the Orlando parks. In March of 2021, the Universal Legacy Store was opened at CityWalk. The store was themed like the name implies, after the legacy of the parks. With nods to classic attractions like Terminator, E.T., Back to the Future, and also including some props from the Ghostbusters Spooktacular show, including the original gargoyle statues, replicas of the proton packs, and costumes from the show. By early 2024, it was all but confirmed that we'd be getting not one, not two, but three Ghostbusters installments at Universal Florida for the summer of 2024. The first being inside the Summer Tribute Store, a temporary merchandise spot that rotates location and theme seasonally. This past summer, we stepped inside a video rental store featuring everyone's favorite Universal classics, some very prominently and some just featured in physical VHSs on a shelf. One that stuck out from the rest was a marquee franchise that Universal never owned, Ghostbusters. Was this cardboard standee in the entryway just a glimpse into their return to the full park? Well, at the same time, Universal would announce the debut of a new nighttime spectacular titled Cinesational. The show was located at the park's lagoon and incorporated lights, fountains, projections, fireworks, and the new introduction to Universal Florida, drones. More than 600 drones lit up the sky with characters or visuals from Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon, E.T., Jaws, and a Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man during the Ghostbusters segment. As someone who is normally very critical of any theme park nighttime show that isn't Happily Ever After at Magic Kingdom, I have to say the show was pretty, it was, it was pretty solid. But the biggest return of them all came on July 3rd of 2024 when Universal debuted their new Mega Movie Parade. Just like the nighttime show, the parade featured a mixture of both old and new movies from Universal Pictures. All of which impressive in their own right, but the overwhelming consensus both in person and online was that the Ghostbusters stole the show. Ghostbusters, you had the love for the old films, the new films, everybody looked perfectly casted. You had Slimer, Mini Puffs, it was great, 10 out of 10. And then you had Bruce, I know there's, there's too many great moments within that parade, but I think Ghostbusters, they went above and beyond. So good. The towering Stay Puffed, the walk around characters from every movie except the 2016 film. Although we didn't get a meet and greet, the parade did leave a great opportunity for interactions with some characters. Nostalgia aside, I feel like at this point in time, the Ghostbusters might not be the front runner for getting a ride or a full blown show here in the parks. With the introduction of the parade and a new drone show, it is obvious that a new long-term licensing deal has been met between Sony and Universal. Otherwise, this likely would have not all happened at once. Hold on, actually, there is one more part of the story I almost forgot. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, only at Universal Halloween Horror Nights, where horror lives. For Halloween Horror Nights' 33rd year of operation, the fans of the event were in for a Frozen adventure. Announced on June 27th, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, a house based off of the new film that was released earlier that year, would be the headlining house of the 2024 season. And lucky for me, I just so happened to be producing this video in October of 2024 during the event. One of the coolest things about the Ghostbusters house here at Halloween Horror Nights in 2024 is the fact that when you're getting in line for the house, you have to cross through the Jimmy Fallon building, which if you were paying attention earlier in the video is actually 
the former location of where the Ghostbusters show used to be. This year, I was lucky enough to be a part of the media event for Halloween Horror Nights Orlando and allowed me to film inside of the haunted houses, which was great because this Ghostbusters house was probably one of the most visually stunning and cinematic houses at the entire event this year. Entering through Ray's occult shop, you'll encounter both Podcast, a new character from the sequels, as well as Ray himself behind the counter, warning you of the dangers of interfering with the spiritual realm. This room was also infested with these mini Stay Puffed marshmallows. In fact, there are so many instances of these little guys throughout the haunted house. According to Universal, there were over 100 throughout multiple rooms some of which fighting with one another and others as tiny little animatronics. This was a great touch, especially because they are such a huge part of the newer movies. Next, moving to the Manhattan Adventure Society room, or at least what's left of it, where the villain of the movie, Garaka, appears for the first time, having turned this club of scholars into a walk-in freezer. Moving further into the depths of New York, we encounter a skull of a dragon in the sewers, I'm a little confused by this part. Before making it back to street level and into the Ghostbusters Paranormal Research Center, where you'd find Lars Pinfield, the resident parabiologist fighting off mini Stay Puffs, Lucky Domingo ready to fend off ghosts with her proton pack, and a Phoebe Spangler lying lifeless in the ionic separator as she separates her spirit from her body in a really cool reveal. Next, we run into a bit of a highlight reel of ghosts from the old movies. Phosphor, a terror dog, and the library ghost attack from all sides in this blacklight hallway leading to the big reveal. Guests would then find themselves at the frozen facade of the firehouse. Cold air was pumping through this room and the other frozen room of the house. Not quite freezing temperatures, but a huge departure from the 90 degree Florida weather outside. Garaka is hiding around the corner of this room in stilt mode, so that was kind of neat. Actually, Horror Nights in 2024 moved all of their stilt performers from the streets into the houses, for what I could only assume were safety reasons. Once inside of the firehouse, Gary Gruberson is tending to the frozen solid containment unit that's breaking through the wall. As you keep moving, Trevor Spangler shoots his proton gun across a long hall where at the end you'll find his target, Slimer, who is rolling around in a trash heap. Now in the main room of the firehouse, guests were greeted by a returning Winston who is ready to fight and the Ecto-1 that had smashed through the wall. On the other side of the room, the big finale, where Phoebe, now back in human form alongside Nadim Razmadi team up to take down Garaka once and for all. Did it work? No. After a tagline from Janine Malnitz, you exit the house to only be scared by one final stilt walking Garaka. Overall, this was probably my second or third favorite house of the year. Not the scariest experience, but sometimes that's what the event needs. Universal Orlando offered three food items and two drinks themed after the Ghostbusters here at Halloween Horror Nights in 2024. Bear in mind, much like the haunted house, these are based off of the Frozen Empire movie. And of course, you know, I had to bring in a foodie expert to talk shop on these Ghostbusters treats. Notice I said foodie expert and not Ghostbusters. Kristen, have you ever seen a Ghostbusters movie? Never in my life. Well, you know these reviews will be unbiased then. Anyways, this is what we're getting first. Arguably the most iconic dish of Halloween Horror Nights this year is the mini Stay Puffed S'more. This is a mini Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man with a chocolate bar and a graham cracker for $6.99. And yes, maybe I have never seen Ghostbusters, but he is cute. And like we talked about recently from the house, I guess this might be the 101th mini Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man here at Halloween Horror Nights. But as you can tell from this B-roll shot, they make hundreds, if not thousands of these per night. 101? That's a word. A term I've never heard before, and you will probably never hear again. <laughs> not only is this one of the most iconic looking treats from Halloween Horror Nights 2024, but it's also honestly like one of the tastiest, probably one of the only things that I would order again. Now I did have this s'more on opening night, and I can tell you it is definitely, it's pretty good. Before we get to these two interesting looking corn dogs, we do want to cover some of these drinks. First up, we have the Class 5 Concoction, which is New Amsterdam Vodka, St. Grenadine, Elden Flower Liquor, 
kiwi syrup, honeydew melon syrup, lime juice, vanilla bean, essence, and fluffed marshmallow topping for $15. Ryan doesn't drink alcohol, so I'm sorry a lot of that pronunciation was off, but don't worry, I'm here to save the day. I will be reviewing the alcoholic beverage. Similar to most other Halloween Horror Nights mixed drinks, you can taste that this doesn't have much alcohol in it. I don't know, I wish there was more marshmallow, wish there was a little bit more liquor, but you win some, you lose some. It's not bad. Next up, we have the non-alcoholic Garaka's Icy Breath. This is honeydew syrup, lime juice, blue curacao, elderflower syrup, and fluffed marshmallow topping. This one actually only costs $8.50, so it's a lot it's a lot cheaper than a $15 drink, which was the other one. I do have a question, though. Garaka is the villain in the new Ghostbusters film. It's his juice. Is this, like, saliva? Or is this other juices? <laughs> I can't say that. I feel I feel like all like it's not mixed very well, so I gotta stir it up even more. But this is way better than I thought. Like I said, there are two themed corn dogs here at the Ghostbusters booths. We have Slimer's Korean corn dog, which is Korean cheese dog with Fritos coated in Cheeto powder, ghost pepper spice, sage derby cheese, and mozzarella for $11.99. I, I don't know why people give this mixed reviews because this is like it's a good it's a good balance it's a cheese it's a dog it's a cheese it's a dog apparently that's how it's laid out we also have the frozen death chill which is a Korean corn dog dipped mint cheesecake with bugle chips and glitter you know the experience of eating this is actually a lot more pleasant than you would think I know on opening night when I tried this I was quite surprised that I enjoyed it too much because a lot of times I feel like minty flavored desserts taste way too much like toothpaste for me. It's way more enjoyable than you would ever think. The Ghostbusters role here at Universal Florida has changed a lot over the past few decades. But one thing that still stands as a monument to the original show is the firehouse. Now obviously, since we are nearly 30 years removed from Ghostbusters Spooktacular existing in this location, the door, the door is no longer in use other than the huge gaping hole punched through the second floor for the roller coaster to pass through, there are a few Easter eggs that have been added in that time. Taking a look at this window, you'll find a pretty unique sign. Michael Mormon, a name that most internally would recognize as the senior director of entertainment at Universal in the 2000s. But he did start off in the company playing the role of Winston in the Ghostbusters Spooktacular. Just on the other side of the garage door, you'll find another name, this time with the title of Paranormal Travel Agent, with the name Thomas E. Matched. A name that I've spent hours trying to figure out who it is, but have found absolutely nothing. So Tom, if you happen to be watching this video, Say hi in the comments. Also, thanks for being here. While we don't know for sure what's in store for the Ghostbusters here at Universal Studios in the future, all signs point to the mega movie parade and the sensational nighttime show making a return seasonally after the holiday parade and Mardi Gras is over. Big thanks to all of my pity viewers over on Patreon for helping make this video possible. For a deep dive on Twister Ride It Out, the special effects show that replaced Ghostbusters Spooktacular, you can find that right here, or one of my all-time favorite videos on this channel will be over on my other side. I am Ryan, this has been For the Love of Theme Parks, and I will see you all real soon.